I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today we take a look at what it takes to get an extreme body from some of my guest athletes. I don't think people give themselves permission enough to be more. Having just released the book which we'll talk about and having released the podcast and teaching people. Before that, there was like a local impact that I wanted to make. And then a national impact. And now a worldwide impact. And it was all about being more, doing more. Can I be more? Can I do more? Can I learn more? And for every single coach that I ever come in touch with, I say to them, are you undervaluing yourself? And are you living your best life and giving yourself the best opportunity to be more? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing all right right now. I'm doing all right. I say, all right is done. Enough is done. We all need challenge. Every single day of our lives, I believe that we need challenge. We need something to work towards. But do I really need a big vision? I said, do you really want to do the same every day? I said to personal trainers so often, being a personal trainer is actually boring. And they look at me and they go, what? I said, it's boring. That's quite something, being a personal trainer. It's boring. Because if you train the same people every day, six hours a day, the clients don't make much progress, you see the same people every single week. It's like being an accountant or a corporate or a lawyer doing the same thing every day without any challenge, without any growth, without any extra income, without going on holidays, without doing more, without being more. Every job that anyone does on the whole planet is boring unless there's new challenge. So I always say to personal trainers, your life is boring because there's no challenge to it. So my advice to every trainer is it doesn't matter whether or not you're what you're doing right now, you need a challenge. You need something bigger and bolder and brighter, brighter and better. And that's what I just kept saying to myself. I charge 35 pounds an hour. How do you find out how to change, train 40? Now, here's the funny thing is, money to me as a trainer, when I got to 85, 90, 100 an hour, that wasn't about money in the bank. That was about worth. Yeah, yes, your value. And when I valued me more, guess what happened? My content got better. My standards got better. My body got better. My social impact got better. My vision got bigger. I valued myself more. I attracted, I remember, going, Ben Pekulski, great friend of mine, wrote the forward for my book, great friend of mine, and I wanted to meet him. And I said, that guy's never going to want to meet me. And was this just before, because we've got to talk about your yeah, bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah, this you. was literally at, when, you just, when you decided that you wanted to enter a competition? Or... Yeah, well, I owned, I've owned M10 Nottingham Gym now for eight years. And prior to that, I had another one for four, year, four and a half years. Uh, four or five, five years. And towards the back end of the first one, which is a 1500 square foot studio, I said, I'm going to give it a bash. I've always wanted to take my body to the next level, not what, just train. What, what really made you want to do it? What Was there something, there was there a void that you were trying to, to fill? Yeah, so when I was younger, I was bullied. Yeah. Um, I wasn't very big. Yeah. Um, I demanded from myself a lot more all the time. I wanted to be as good as I could be at rugby. I wanted to be as strong as I could. And the whole the whole bullying thing. Um, when I was reading a book, just skips my mind. And uh, I, if you have comments on YouTube, I'd love to actually put it in when, uh, when I remember. But I read a book, and it basically was explaining body your body as a shield of armor or a completion of your character. And when I started bodybuilding, I was walking around, and I'd be the classic guy walking around town, being out and about, pushing people, even though I was still wasn't very big. And I realized that it was a shield of armor. It was a protective mechanism to give me that, hey, I'm a bigger guy. And then as I got bigger and bigger, because I realized you were as a child. I was bullied. And, I, and it gave me this opportunity to just walk in, and people go, oh, you're a big boy. You're a big boy. I was like, yeah, I like that. I like that. And, but I loved training. I loved how it made me feel. And suddenly it was just, just empowering me and making me more confident and so much was happening in business and it served me. But then I suddenly realized that, you know, this isn't me, 100%. So is it a shield of armor or is it a completion of my character? My body is a part of me, but I'm as whole with it without it. 
It makes me feel great. I love it. I love training. I love the challenge. I love looking good. Uh, you know, I truly believe that from a male's perspective, we should be strong. And, you know, I, I believe that, that you don't have to be big or muscular. But for me, I think it's an embodiment of your physical journey. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big belief that I have. But it's not that I try and get other people to do that. But for me, it was a big thing that was mattered to me. And so the bodybuilding eventually became part of me as opposed to a shield for me, you know? And, and bodybuilding, after a while, just blended into being this deep, inspired passion that had a knock-on effect with my, you know, meeting right people. And, and you met Ben. Sorry, well, that well, no, 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 you're right, you're right. But, but, but what happened was, I said to myself, I'm not going to meet the people that I'm inspired by if I'm not, if I haven't got anything to be inspired by. So like, why would a millionaire talk to you at a dinner if you've not got anything at their level to talk about. So let's build a bloody body. But I also realized that if I build a body and I have a business and I have a brain, I'm gonna make myself more attractive to the people that are gonna help me take my career to the next level. So I remember sitting at the front of a seminar and I was two days before it was a seminar in Tampa and Ben was speaking and I said, I need to meet this guy. So I booked a flight, went there for two days and I sat at the front and at the end, I went, excuse me, and I asked him a question. I went to the one side afterwards. I said, can I take you for breakfast? And we went, we had breakfast, and we got on really well. And he followed me on social media, and I'd just done my photo shoot. After, and he was like, dude, you look in great shape. And I was like, that worked. What does that prep look like to you? You said it was, it, do you cut down a lot on your food? Well, you do it first, if you have like a little you know, little extras like, I love chocolate, I love little biscuits with my tea, I would put, you know, eat yogurt at the wrong time of the day, you know, because all these things are, after that, they're calculated into your, your, so if you clean that up first, doesn't mean you have to low down in calories, but don't have the odd chocolate biscuits, um, and, you know, oh, I'm more hungry, I'm not eating, you know, so you start, you've got to start eating, eating regularly. every, yeah, yeah, regularly, and then uh, weigh your food, which I do anyway, I always weigh yeah. my food. Yeah, I think you get into that, yeah. I certainly, I still do. Don't um, you think? I've just got into the habit of doing it. Yeah, because don't you think, if you want to stay a certain weight, don't you think it's fantastic to be able to weigh your food, you know exactly how much you're putting into your body, you know it's perfect, it's like putting petrol in a car, you can't take any more petrol, the car will run perfectly well, this amount of petrol, you know, it's, you know, with this amount of food and amount of calorie, you'll stay exactly. You're going to stay yeah. exactly the way you are. And this yeah. is what you need for your own body. Mm -hmm. So. People would think it's a little bit crazy to do that, but I think, you know, I'm comfortable with it. I don't weigh everything, like, obviously the biscuits I'm eating, I'm not weighing, but Yeah, when you're off season, do you do it as I a I still you, weigh, so yeah, yeah I weigh my, my carbs. I know how much carbs I'm having. Yeah. And, and do you think, because um, it's, it's interesting that the off season and then going into prep, um, that... <laughs> In terms of your body changing, because you do have to put a little, we've just talked about it before, yeah. you have to, and especially for a woman, you do have to put a bit of weight on to gain the muscle. Is that tough? Is that a difficult thing to get your head around? I know you... A lot of people say, no, I love eating. This is great. I can eat whatever I want. I don't have any restrictions. But, um, you know, I've always liked to have some silhouette. Mm. Yeah, you've got a, fan, a fantastic figure. <laughs> and, and all your and clothes you're a small, a small lady. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really suit my face this. neither. I get a bit too... So that can be mm, quite... I like to have an angular space, space and it's just like, it was all round and over. <laughs> I was like, ah, I don't like that. Even my mom. In, I went for, to Christmas and I was bulking and she went, hmm, I don't know if this is really your best you mm -hmm. ever looked at. <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, really, my, my, yeah, my whole family was going, whoa, you got big legs, you know. So, yeah, I was getting... Yeah, I don't really like the bulking face, okay. but a lot of people would like it. Yeah, and you've it. just recently competed in WBFF. I saw the photos yes, in I November. Did. You looked amazing. I was the eldest one on stage. And at yeah. 53. I had a 20 I just, year old next to me. 53. And yeah. you went open category. Yeah. I mean, the, the, whole, ca the whole category was open. Um, so it was 22 of us on stage. Unfortunately, I didn't place. Um, it was too tough for the category. But you look fantastic, though. I mean, I saw the yeah. photos. I'm, and the I'm happy. You know, I don't really. At my age, I, I don't 
wait for approbation anymore. You know, I, I'm 53 years of age. I've, I think it's difficult to, to judge me against who? Of against course. another 53? There's you, none. Do you find it hard mentally, though, to get on stage with the 20-something-year-olds and... I just, obviously you get a little self-conscious, like, oh, am I out of place? Is, am I going to be, you know, I said to my friends in the fitness industry, and I don't know if they were going to recognize themselves, but I do say to them, promise me I'm not delusional, and you will tell me when it's time to take the gloves off. Promise me you, like, mm, really, we don't really want to see you in a bikini anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, mm, it's not that nice anymore. Can mm. you just put some clothes Clear on? That. <laughs> So I said, promise me, no, 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 you can still do it, don't worry. You absolutely look fantastic, you're a long way off but, that, sure. Yeah, but there will be a stage where we don't want to look anymore at someone a bit older. You know, yeah, you look great, but you don't have to be in a bikini on heels on stage, yeah. okay? There's a point where you have to go, okay, I fucking guess. So we have good days, we have cold days, and it's very hard to motivate yourself outside in the garden when it's when it's raining or when it's really super cold. <laughs> have your kids been helping you? <laughs> I have, I, but to be honest with you, I have been doing some training while I've been here at home. I had my kids doing some press-ups and sit-ups with me and stuff and do some little sprints with them. So I have been running around with them doing a bit of a, uh, little bit of exercise. I even take them for a little walk or maybe I'll jog and they can ride their bike and follow me. So yeah, we've been doing a little bit like that. Now, I couldn't have this interview with asking you a little bit more about the boxing scene. How do you think COVID-19 yeah. is going to affect the sport going forward? Well, I think it is going to be affected. Uh, and I think already you see that there's a lot of talk about uh, having boxing events behind closed doors. Mm. Now, um, not having fan base there, I think it's going to be very hard to motivate yourself. Just recently, I saw an MMA fight, a UFC fight, which was behind closed doors and there was no fans there, but it was a big fight. And obviously, it just wasn't the same. You know, the buzz wasn't there. The lights weren't the same. I mean, not having fans there is uh, is not going to really motivate the, the fighters. You could see both fighters when they were in the, in the cage fighting. Uh, there was no motivation. It was just like they, was, they were there for a sparring session. Because it's the energy, but, I guess, from, you get from the room that lifts energy you. Energy and... from the group, yeah, from the people, from the from the fans, the energy you get, them screaming, shouting, and it just, um, it didn't seem right, you know, when I was watching it on, uh, on, on, on TV. So I just feel that I think um, it's going to be a very long time till boxing um, gets back on track again, I think. Hopefully next year, early next year, we can probably have our fights back on again and get back in the ring and put on great performances. But at this moment in time, we don't know where this is going. We don't know how long the lockdown is going to be till. And we don't know when we are allowed to um, put on shows and mix with, mix with our loved ones and with our people. Mm. When do you think you'll be back in the ring? And uh, do you think you'll be back in the ring? Have you got sort of future plans? Yeah, I want to be... Oh, definitely, I want to be back in the ring again. And I think for me, it will be um, probably early next year then, depending. I mean, I wanted to fight in March, to be honest with you, but that's who's when the COVID Who's the next fighter? In. Who do you want to, who's your um, next? I'm looking at some names at the moment. Look, I'd love to fight Manny Pacquiao. I mean, that's a name that I'm, I've always been chasing. And if I can get that fight, that'd be amazing. But um, look, there's so many names out there now in the in the world that you can fight, especially in the world um, welterweight division, which I mean, there's some good tasty fighters in there. So I look at all options. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's just uh, knowing when we're allowed to... See, because even when you're training, what are you training for? You need that motivation, what you're training for. Uh, I'm in good shape, but I'm thinking, okay, do I need to get in better shape? No, I mean, but if, they have a, if I have a goal, end goal, which is maybe have a fight on a date, then I can be like, okay, I'm going to chase that date now. I'm going to train for that date and for that fight. That's my motivation, but at this moment in time, it's hard because if I if I start training hard now, by the time the fight comes, hey, come next year, end of next year, then I'm gonna be worn out by then, right? Maybe you know, worked out, worn yeah. out, yeah, worn out. I'm gonna be overtrained. How long does it normally take? How long does it normally take you to get in condition for a fight? Um, takes me around a bit. I normally give myself ten weeks, and that that's ten weeks of like um, eating clean. Uh, training, uh, do my strength conditioning and also boxing. 
Are you still training with a coach now while you're in lockdown? Uh, I don't know if you can do it. Can't, no, I, I can't do the coach. You can't? No, I can't do with the coach, no. Um, see, because I've got young kids and I want to try to stay away from as many people as I can. Um, but what I'm doing is I am doing like a lot of training on my own, like shadow boxing or some exercises outside, press up, sit up, squats and go for a little jog now and then, go for a walk with the kids. So kind of keep myself busy. What do you think we've, when all this is over with in six months' time, what, do you, what lessons do you think we can learn from this? I think what we can learn from it is we're going to start to appreciate what we have and the things around us and appreciate your family, your friends, mm -hmm. especially because yeah. we've not been seeing our friends. We've not been, we, we can't go for a walk to a corner shop. See, we, we took everything for granted. A lot of people did, and you think, oh, yeah, we can get this and we can get that. But now being locked in, not being allowed to go out anywhere, makes you realize that the things that we did have, the amazing things that we did have, we don't have anymore. So I just feel that, um, you know, we're going to just appreciate everything around us, every little second out with our family, with our friends, and everyone, we're going to appreciate that. So I think that's what it's all about. It's all about uh, appreciating what we've got. And, and, and when we don't have it, that's when we realize that, you know, we don't have these things. and we really want it. So, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I feel um, we, we've missed. And, it's pre and it makes you understand as well how much we missed it as well. You've been in this game for a long time. In fact, you're, you're a long-standing professional at MMA fighting. And you got to Cage Warriors and, and you, you, you had a very, very big fight um, that could have been taking you to the next level. Um, but something happened there. Can you tell me about that fight and a little bit how that was maybe the turning point? So that was, I was fighting on for Bama, uh, for Bama World Title. And that was Wembley Arena. Um, and yeah, you're right. That, that was my chance. I was fighting for the World Title. Had I'd won, I could have got to the next step. Uh, I didn't win. Um, I, I got knocked out in the first round. Um, and still today, like that's one of the moments, definitive moments of my career. You know, and people ask me, how, how does it feel? Um, how does it feel? <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. just anyone, but how, how, how did it feel? Who you know were, what, yeah. Who were you fighting? Uh, I, I, fought, I was fighting Alex Lahore. I fought Alex Lahore. Um, so, yeah, that was two years ago. Uh, September 17, so two and a half years ago. And funnily enough, when it, I'm ever asked, how do I feel? It's always a different answer each time. It honestly depends okay. how, I, how I feel. Do, do you know what I mean? Um to how I feel at the moment, to how I would look back at, at those experiences. Um, but recently, it's I feel I feel okay about it. I can sit there, watch the fight, you know, um, break it down how I was feeling, what I should have done, you know, and I've drawn uh, lessons from there. Um, what lessons have you drawn from there? Well, for the first of all, one, it's a sport, you yeah. know. If you don't win, it's okay. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not the end of the world. But at the same time. You can't just accept defeat, you know. You, no, no one's defined by their losses. Do, do, mm, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. you get up on that horse and you, you get up and, and, you, and you try it again. And that's something that I've had to prove to myself and also show everybody else that it can be done. And even having your moment uh, slip out of your fingertips, literally, you know what I mean? Um, it can still be done. So uh, there, there are a couple of the main things that still ring true to me now. You know, like in this minute, you know, ask me tomorrow, I might be like, oh, get rid of that. You know, I, mean, I don't want to see that. But um, no, you know, it's, it's bittersweet. It's bittersweet. A valuable lesson that I wouldn't uh, take away, but at the same time, it could have happened, you know what I mean, somewhere else, like down the line. Like, oh, that world the title, past is you in know the past, what I mean? Though, right? You just got to, like, yeah. No, exactly. Learn, exactly. As you say, learn the lessons, and it, there's something bigger and better that exactly. maybe will come from this. But, you know, that's also what I like about the sport. The sport, for me, is a reflection of real life. That it's not always easy. And mm -hmm. if there's something out there that you want, you've got to fight for it. Do, 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 do you know what I mean? Um, and that's what I do in my martial arts. And it, the, the emotional roller coaster that we go through is... is I don't think I could... It, me trying to explain it, I'll do it justice. Do you know what I mean? The highs are high and, and the lows are low. And yeah, at that moment in time, losing that fight and other big fights... Um, you know, of a fought abroad, of a fought all up and down the country. You know, having those big fights and, and not getting them, it's like it is. What what makes you keep getting back up 
and doing it again. Um, because you mentioned yeah. like that's part of well, part yeah. of the industry, no, part exactly. of the martial arts, and what you exactly. love about and that roller coaster. But there must be some sort of inner strength or mental man, mental mindset. Well, they, they, you just said it. It is that inner strength and it is that mental mindset. To, you know that that we all need. And the good thing about sport is we put ourselves out there. You know, I can. I'm choosing to make myself comfortable with being uncomfortable. So I go out there, put myself out there to try and improve, to try and get better uh, and to develop that resilience, you know. And by me putting myself in those conditions will better prepare me for, you know, the, the resilient times in the real world, you know. So it's, it's a funny story where I went from retiring from football to signing up to my first ever running race. And it, that gap, people think oh, it might be a couple of months. It was literally about two hours. Two hours? Yeah. So I hobbled. So you didn't sort of, you know, hesitate for a while, two hours? No, not at all. So I, I hobbled home and I was icing my calf muscle, which was the final straw that, that broke the camel's back in terms of retiring. And I decided that's it. I'm going to. I'm done. I was icing my calf. And then my mind started to wander because I was in this dark place mentally and I wasn't able to fulfill my potential. I had this chip on my shoulder as, a, as an athlete. Like I didn't really feel like I got the most out of my body as an athlete. And also I was trying to run away from life. So I did the only logical thing at the time I thought was, it was Google this race that a friend of mine told me about a couple of years ago that was through the middle of Sahara Desert. And I found it, it was in six months, and I called them up and I said, can I have a place? And they were like, if you pay your deposit now, and I was like, sure. And literally my life savings got transferred into this deposit for this race. And I hung up the phone and went, holy, I'm doing the Marathon de Sables, which is wow. the, the equivalent of six marathons in seven days through the Sahara Desert in six months time. So you're literally, you're icing your calf, giving up your professional football career, and decide to do the Marathon de Sable. I thought it made sense at the time. <laughs> wow. So Marathon de Sable, I, I've heard a bit about mm -hmm. it and, and I've actually, funnily enough, I've been to the end of that race okay. in the Sahara and I've seen the guys that are crossing the finish line. Uh, I, I was in tears. It was a very emotional experience because these people are just practically dragging themselves through the sand after being seven days. Mm. Uh, how was that for you? What, what experiences did you, did you go through? Oh, I learned a lot about myself in those seven days. Um, I went out there, as I said, with six months of, of training and research and, and understanding how I needed to get from point A to point B at the end of each day and also at the end of the seven days. And as I said, I was out there to run away from life, so I really punished myself. I was running hard. I wanted to finish in the elite top 50, which is this sort of like tagline for the top 50 athletes. And I went for it and I went out really hard and I think I did everything right in terms of my uh, preparation, apart from I overtrained a little bit. So I had a few niggles going into the race. Um, but then also the other thing I didn't know until I got out there was my, <laughs> that being too graphic, my feet sweat quite a lot when I, when I run in hot, hot um, climates, which I didn't know because I only ever played football, so 90 minutes, you're done. But after several hours of running in that heat, my feet sweat a lot. So what happens when like, you're in the bath and you're spending too long in the bath, your skin gets, gets really wrinkly, soft yes, and yeah, really wrinkly. wrinkly. So then I'm running along on day three and I've got these blisters because all my skin's soft and it's rubbing, I take my shoes off and literally two thirds of my little toe has just been degloved. Oh. So it's just red, raw, uh, infected, and the big chunk of skin has just basically come off. And that was the end of day three. I had a double marathon to do the next day. So what? So you continued with this toe hanging off? Yeah, yeah. So there's doctors out there, and they and they patched it up as much as I could, and as they could. And then I set off and did the double marathon. And after 25 kilometres, I was extremely dehydrated and had no idea who I was or what I was doing. So. They forced me to have an intravenous drip as well, which is something that not too many people can say they've had, an intravenous drip mm -hmm. in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Uh, and then I continu continued on to finish that day. All the while, I was fueled with the whole point of I'm running away from my life. I didn't know how to 
uh, face up to the fact I wasn't a footballer anymore. I hadn't grieved in that process. Mm -hmm. I hadn't put that to bed, so to speak, and moved on. It was still there. I had this massive chip on my shoulder, so I wanted to prove to myself that I was still a good enough athlete to achieve something. And I was really practicing self-harm every single day when I was out there trying to push myself um, to finish this race. So I'd technically really been up nearly 48 hours straight and then I'm off to the venue. So I go to the venue and then when I got in the venue I felt fine, hip pads warmed up, everything's fine. Hadn't really sunk in, I was USC fighter yet, got my shorts, my names on the shorts. I walk out to the venue, as I walk out, <coughs> feels great, get to the pit, they vast me up, I'm like yeah we're good, but on the way to the cage that's when I was thinking how am I going to approach this fight? Like, do I go hard? Do I go not? I shouldn't be thinking this. No, not at all. I but, mean, I'm not a fighter, you know but I guess I mean? your mindset's got to be solid and really. Yeah. So really with with focused. with an eight week camp, they they we we sorted out a game plan. I know what I'm fucking doing. I'm and now, what was your was your coach there with you? Yeah, coach was there, yeah. but they like they all said how it would go. We all knew that I'd come out, and as soon as I lay one hand on him, he ain't gonna want to stand. He's meant to be a stand up fighter, but we're getting shooting. And the aim as soon as he takes me down, I'll just smash him on the floor because that is my strength. Like. Mm. I, no one beats me on the floor, especially in MMA when I get a punch on. So in my mind, it was like, my probably takes me down. So the whole game plan was hit him, hit rush in, and then we beat him up on the floor. So then when I got into the cage, I did notice that as I started to get towards the cage, my legs started feeling heavy. heavy. And I remember back in the early days fighting, it's called an adrenaline dunk, and I started to feel that effect. And then when I got in the cage, I see the big monster sign on the floor, the logo, and it's like, Okay, I'm a okay. Fuck, I'm you here. Are a I'm here. I look around it. and I see, like, the commentators, like, Dana White again, it's all them, and I'm like, all right, I'm here. This is the main card. Everyone's watching. Like, fucking knock this guy out, man. So I always sat in my head, yeah, I'm going to knock him out. And then I just thought myself, stop overthinking it, man. You know, just hit him. Just hit him. He's going out. And then we come out, and obviously, for a couple of leg kicks, I knew it was happening because I'd seen that before in my visualization of him and watching him. He always comes out, for a couple of low kicks. I've checked the third. Knew it hurt him. And then I knew then he comes with his spinny stuff and I saw that. I was like, yeah, fuck off, you ain't doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and then tried to do a flying knee, just ducked under that, looked at him, had him on the fence, threw a cut of faint. Didn't want, I could see he was scared. He was just like anticipating getting Yeah, hit. yeah, you look strong at the... As soon as I hit him, his corner went, don't fuck with his power. And then my coaches were like, he didn't like that. And I was like, All right, now I've got his attention. And then bang, he just fucking hit a double. He took me down, and I'm not even joking. When he took me down, I just felt like everything leaving my body. I was about body. to say, so when, because I, I watched it, how, when, when he was there, on yeah, top of you. he took me down, and I, honestly, I went to like bump him off. And no, in fact, I moved for, I, I did bridge him, I swept him straight away, but that took so much out of me. I did generally feel, I felt like, fuck you. Know, like, At what exhausted. point did you think, fuck, I've lost this? Or, I, I didn't or... think I lost this. I never, I never ever in my mind, I think I lost it, so I just thought, oh, fuck that, it's going to be a bit of a long night. I'll just wait for my give it time and I'll bang him. Like, it made, like, it made literally yeah. that calm and that collective, it made. And that's why if you look back at it, they never once do I look panicked or worried or scared or hurt, because I weren't. And it, but in my mind, I was just talking to myself, thinking, fucking, he's like a little monkey jumping over me and I, ain't got, I can't keep up with him. Like, because he was, and I could feel myself, like, easy to say to explain it, it like I was saying earlier, if you've got, if you go and train chest tonight, do a heavy chest session, next two days, your, your chest is burnt. You can't go lift any weights. So obviously from the weight cut, my body's fatigued. Yeah, yeah. You so now I was like, after I bruised him, it was like that was the last bit of my real like explosiveness. And anyone knows that trains me that they can't hold me down. I'll, I'll get out. I'm, I'm really explosive with my hips and that. So when I did that and I exploded and I went for the choke and then, I remember thinking I heard a klaxon for some reason, but it weren't. I thought it was a 10 second, so I kind of just like built it out on the floor, thinking, oh, whatever, he's not going to do anything. And he started like, he landed to cut the shots, cut the elbows. I'm thinking, this is a long 10, 10 seconds. And I'm like, that wasn't a 10 second klaxon. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, bit just, but do you know what I mean? In my mind, I'm just thinking about everything else instead of just Concentrate kill this on. motherfucker. Yeah. Like, normally I'm just kill. Like, I don't care about the time. I'm, I, I don't want no time. I just want to get you. I want to just inflict as much pain and damage as I can. But I won't. I won't just weren't in that. And then I'm thinking, right, the the round finished. And I remember getting up to my knees and I remember just thinking, I just sat there for a second. I was just like, I've got to fucking bang him. 
right, maybe I'll hold off in a second and leave, empty it all in the third, because then I know there's not another round, so I can just give it all, but I didn't want to empty it all in a second, him just avoid punishment, because we are remembering here that he's at the elite level, and he's been training six months, so he's fully conditioned, so if he just needs to defend for a round, he could probably he could just defend. It. Yeah. And yeah. if I'm just gassing his feet, then... You're going to kill yourself, yeah, all and, yourself out. And then, I'm, then I end up thinking I'm going to look stupid or whatnot. So I then get up and then I remember going back to my corner and I was just, that's when I knew I, like looking back on it now, I, was, I didn't even pay attention to my corner because I was just thinking like... Were you out of it at that point? I was out, yeah. Because the commentator said that it looked like you'd been badly, like, hit yeah, and I, that you were like... Yeah, so but, it's, mean, it's, it's so... Fr there. It is frustrating it, listening to the commentators talk like, oh, it looked like he, he got caught or hurt it. There was no pain. I was just in my head. I'm thinking, fuck. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, there's a new interview out every Monday. So hit subscribe and like, and you'll get it straight into your inbox. I believe health is the greatest form of wealth we have which is why I'm so excited to be partnered with Brother in Arms. Brother in Arms is a wellness brand dedicated to working with veterans, first responders, and anyone on the front line. Through their education, support, and premium CBD products, they help alleviate and restore the lives of those that have been affected by physical and mental trauma. Learn about the life-changing benefits and power of CBD. Join their community today. Hit the link below.